Welcome back to my educational blog, Edis English Literature. I am Ardhindu De. Today, we are going to discuss Aristotle's view on poetic imitation. And we will also try to understand how he refuted the charges made against poetry by his master Plato. In Aristotle's view, poetic imitation is an act of imaginative creation by which the poet draws his poetic material from this phenomenal world and makes something new out of it. But one thing you must have to remember that Aristotle's master Plato himself invented the term imitation. Now, the whole contention is about defining the imitation and how far a poet is uh, taking that imitation in his ideology. But before you go into further discussion, uh, you probably know the relationship between Plato and Aristotle. I think you all know that uh, for some 20 years odd, Aristotle was Plato's student and colleague at his academy in Athens. Although Aristotle revered his teacher, his philosophy eventually departed from Plato's uh, in some important respects. And here is such a case. And here we will discuss how far Aristotle's view on this particular issue departs from his master Plato. Now, try to understand the argument in some logical manner. At present, I am seated on this wooden chair. Now, um, how the chair comes? The chairness is the very idea, you know, the capability of giving you a seat. Now, that idea is the supreme one. It is said by Plato and Aristotle makes no argument in this case. Aristotle says that's okay, idea is supreme, realistic and divine. But out of that idea, so many of the chairs made. It is made by carpenters. Now, are the chairs all a grossy, filthy imitation? And the carpenters are mere imitators? Are the chairs mechanically made? No, they are artistically made. Each and every one piece of these chairs throughout the world are unique by the very stamp of artistic unity and uniqueness. They are no surface imitation, but aesthetic representations of the original one. That original idea that I have just told you, the very chairness. Creativity is no mechanical process like that of robotic one, but it's a process that comes from within, from the soul, from the mind. Now put this discussion in some lucid way in, uh, in, in terms and terminology that Aristotle defines through his poetics. As I have told you, first of all, it was Plato, not Aristotle, who invented the term imitation. In Plato's view, a work of art is no more than an imitation of imitation. He argues that a carpenter can make no more than an imitation of the reality. And the bed, suppose, he makes is once removed from the truth, the very idea. But when the same bed is being imagined and painted by a painter, as the Plato argument goes on, that it is twice removed from the truth. First it was removed from the truth by the carpenter, then the, by the imitation process. By the painter. So in like manner the poet too creates 
only a copy of a copy. The very idea and they are being uh, the exhibition and from that exhibition the poet is being copying all those ideas and making its own and the word play. So Plato is saying that poets are also making a copy out of a copy. So he is twice removed. However, to our rescue Aristotle bats for. Aristotle holds that poetry or for that matter any fine art is not an imitation of imitation twice removed but imitation of reality in his view uh, imitation is the objective representation the very objective representation is from life and that representation is made through in literature in fine arts it is through painting so it is the imaginative reconstructions of life imitation distinguishes what we call creative literature from the literature which is didactic and the critics scott james has readily defined these terms a literature which is a creative one is more refined, more sophisticated, more rejuvenated into the spirit of creativity and that is not a mere imitation but a creative impulse. Aristotle's syllogistic argument is quite straightforward here. Aristotle first of all begins his inquiry by confining it to the epic poetry, tragedy, comedy and dithyrambic poetry along with the music, flute, the lyre accompanied them. So Aristotle's argument is quite convincingly stated that point of view and he makes a distinguish of the subject treated. He calls uh, the object imitated rather. He says the medium in which it is treated and the manner of treatment, the objects of imitation and uh, accordingly all of the views and concerning points are somehow exhibits man in action. In his view, imitation is not a mere photographic representation of the surface thing that I have already stated, but a real representation or a real literature is like that of a creative process and that creative process is never mechanical. Suppose a poet writes something, a painter paints something, first of all he has to select those ideas make the orders of the materials or the compositions he finds in front of him and in this way he recreates a kind of a reality in the process of his selection obviously the poet prefers the impossibilities to make a probable show of it or rather improbable possibilities he turns it together so aristotle says probable impossibilities are made improbable possibilities by the poet by the painters and a poet who is a genuine one also recreates this kind of emotions the elements of universality is pumped in. when a mere object has been a particular, his selection and his universal quality put it into general category. Gradually the particularities of a particular thing or object is dropped, discarded and generalities are accepted and adopted. 
that acceptance and adoption is the very quality or the very geniusness of the poet and the universality is gained so a poetry from japan touches our heart a poetry from england touches the indians so universal quality is the very feature of it the language the rhythm the harmony is the very medium by which the universality has been shared to each other the painter on the other hand imitates the form and color the musician imitates through the rhythm and harmony and the poets as i have told you and the painter and the musician differ from one another in terms of its presentations but the way or the root of their arguments or argumentative presentations is very clear the treatment might be different as i have told you in the case of poet the manner of treatment differs from jar to jar in epic poetry in, the, in different kind of poetry there is different kind of presentative ways of argument epic is a narrative art tragedy is as you all know imitation of accents and the way or the presentation through dramatic accents or dramatic manner so diversified way of presentations but the roots are quite or the root in root their presentation is quite similar they are not imitating or they are rather gaining some universality from particular to general the universality or the access to each and every one is being done by the poet and that's the artistic genius again in aristotle's view art imitates nature in poetics he says the objects of imitation are man in action but what does aristotle say by his choice of the word nature by nature he means a creative force the productive principles of this universe if we classify in modern terminology we may call it the life force the elan vital the inherent nature so by imitation of nature aristotle does not mean imitation of external nature by it he rather means imitation of the creative impulse man is a supreme creation of god he is endowed with the impulse the possibilities of creativity and a man is genius in that way of his thought content and philosophy a kind of a creative impulse is always haunting each and every man from the origin of fire making to that of living in the tent or living in that cave man is empowered with creative impulse he has an urge to rise upward the poet imitates the sigilage upward rising of man what ought to be is the very principle to be followed by the poet and that our job refining oneself and defining oneself is the forward journey of imagination of us and it cannot be twice removed from original it cannot be an imitation of an imitation but rather a perfection of oneself into that imaginary goal into that imagination or into that imitation if it says in general term objects of action in fact are man in action man's action are external as well as internal the internal action may be the action within the soul caused by all the uh, feelings or all the aspects of our ideologies that pop up in our mind does all that is roused in human heart suppose the emotions the the passions the feelings and all such things find an expression in the art as imitation of reality 
So this imitation cannot be a gross one. The external world acts as a background to that inward activity of the human soul. The external world is like that of a green screen of us to change the panoramic view. So our internal mechanism of our mind, our soul is the originality of creativity and the object that we find is only but a post of light but not light itself. The light comes from the soul. Light comes from our mind. But Plato, his master, considered poetry an imitation of imitation. You know, the shadow of shadow, twice removed from the truth. What Plato says, or arguably what Plato defined poetry, that this phenomenal world was created by God. And accordingly, all of these worldly objects comes from the idea that pops up in God's mind. So idea is the reality that I have shared you in the initial parts of my lecture. And imitation of that idea, if I say, is the very copy of the reality. The poet imitates this copy Hence, this imitation is imitation of an imitation. But his disciple Aristotle refuted this charge. That okay, the poet imitates the real idea that he finds or something shadow of the thing that he finds. But poet does not copy the external reality or external world. He is not copycat. He recreates, rejuvenates those realities. He creates something new according to his own idea. That oneness, that oneness, that uniqueness is the very creative impulse. Thus, even an ugly object, well imitated, becomes a source of fun, becomes a source of pleasure. It becomes a thing of perpetual happiness, joy, beauty forever. So, poetry is a creative impulse, a creative process. The real and the ideal from Aristotle's points of view are not opposites. The ideal is the real. Thus, Aristotle quite successfully refuted the contention of Plato. He provided a strong defense of poetry by blowing up Plato's theory of poetic imagination or poetic imitation. He gave quite a new interpretation of the theory of poetic imitation. While Plato had discarded poetry and commanded that the poets to be banished from his ideal republic, Aristotle put poetry on the high pedestal of honor and he says that poetry to be honored because he is very close to creative impulse. The original creator had been the God. The second creator is the very imaginative artist and the poets. He recognized poetic works and poetic imitations as a creative process. If such a creative process is there, then the original creator God and the other creator poet and the artist are quite same. That was Aristotle's great contribution in the field of literary criticism. I must say that Aristotle's this argument in the poetic has survived the lives of the poets. Otherwise, all the poets should have been thrown into Arabian Sea. So, Aristotle's theory of imitation is a great landmark in the history of literary criticism. It has been accepted all over the world as a guiding principle. By declaring uh, the poetic Im imaginative or poetic Im imitations a creative process, Aristotle has given a new life to the poets. As far as criticism or critical theories are concerned, poetry is very high place 
and the high realm of art and literature and he has placed or justified that very positions and his poetics stand out in this argumentative technique so i think you have gone through all this lecture uh, and understood a bit uh, the theory of imitation and the theory that plato and aristotle are quite arguably differ from each other if you have any questions regarding this just pop up here and ask me question i will try my best to give you answers like share comment and obviously subscribe to my channel to stay tuned to this kind of post and lectures bye bye